Okay. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're gonna discuss Pathwork Lecture number 163. Um, and it was May 10th, 1968, that this was originally channeled. And the title is Mind Activity and Mind Receptivity. Charlie, can you clear the screen from the, this meeting is being recorded? I think you have to do it. You have to affirm it, acknowledge it. So see if you can find the place to click. Do you get it? Okay. So, um, so the guide is saying, greetings, my beloved friends. The love of the universe embraces every manifestation and individualization of the divine being, especially when the outer separated self strives so ardently to find the truth of being the truth of self, thus the truth of life. All the pain and frustration the average human being goes through in the course of a lifetime is solely the result of not knowing your true identity. And the constant struggle of living comes from a vague feeling in your unconscious that there is something to recapture, some secret key that could open life. You know deep within that life cannot be merely what you experience from day to day or what it is at the moment. So you strive away from the moment. And when you do so, you lose the moment and with it, the meaning of life. For every single moment contains all of life. I don't know if people recognize this. I know, you know, it was the great emptiness that I felt for most of my life. And I, I later on realized, you know, how I was not only, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I was literally rejecting each moment, right? You know, that's not it. That's not it. Because I would compare it with my expectation, my idealized image, whatever, you know. And, and so, you know, I was always um, rejecting the very life that I was given. So there's a way that when we can you know, recognize and realize the, the value and the, the depth and the, you know, everything in each moment, you know, then we're, we're actually, you know, coming home to the soul, to the self, to the deeper, you know, reality and identity of who we are. So the struggle to discover the true self and to accept the now are not mutually exclusive. They are interdependent. So, and then he goes into, you know, this way of um, working with these two aspects of life, um, the powerful forces or attitudes that are, you know, everywhere in the universe, everywhere in each human personality. And one is the striving, moving, acting, initiating, activating, doing force. And this aspect includes self-responsibility, independence, autonomy, free choice, and the power of the self. The other is being receptive to and waiting for whatever is to happen. And this aspect includes patience, humility, the awareness of interdependence, and of being a part of a whole. It has trust in the processes of the greater life. The former involves direct action. The later means waiting for growth and indirect manifestation, which takes place in its own way and according to its own laws. So just curious, like, I mean, these are, you know, very powerful balanced forces. And yet, you know, most of us are, much more familiar with the activating one, right? You know, so as you, you read this, you know, how do you feel or, you know, how does that strike you, you know, this, these two descriptions? And can you feel inside of yourself your own inner balance or lack thereof, you know, what is your percentage, you know, one way or the other? Well, I'll jump in. It's, um, it's less so, but it still seems like a bit of a contradiction between the two. 
Um, if if I my old self about self responsibilities means I have to plan ahead and think ahead and um, what I'm going to do and when I'm going to do it and how and who and what I'm going to say. Um, and so it seems to be in a way a contradiction to uh, trusting and letting things unfold and uh, and listening and uh, yeah and then get caught in when I'm listening is like well I don't hear anything what am I what's up you know what am I and so it's a very curious uh, um, it seems like a dichotomy but I having said that I'm very clear that I'm much more in my life moving into the um, the space of not knowing and just allowing things to unfold and uh, and letting it guide me more and more so it really helps to do that but it's really contrary to my former life so it's, it's and, and that's that's beautiful because I, I mean in some ways right you know especially i mean in general in the medicine wheel right you know the the time of you know old age is a time that we go back into the being quadrant like the uh, mark Plotkin has like the being quadrant and the doing quadrant on the medicine wheel right so and 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 childhood is a being quadrant and then we go into you know early or late adolescence and early adulthood and you know mature adulthood and you know like all of that is kind of in the doing quadrant and then as we move back into old age we we move back onto the east side of the the wheel and the, the actual being quadrant of life and so you know it's beautiful and in, in some ways it's a trustworthy process that deepens us and allows us you know and, and in some ways if we hadn't been all into the doing before you know we we may not you know have you know reached sort of the the natural balance right of that um if that active place got obstructed too and there is a way where he talks about sort of the passive you know, resistance, you know, like we can kind of check out or withdraw instead of the healthy being part of it. So that's a good example, though. And, and you know, I think it, I think we all are. I think the earth also is in a transformation that is undergoing sort of more uh, a, a deepening and a activating of the balance with the being aspect of life. Anybody else? So when a person consciously or unconsciously believes that one of these two ways of functioning is the right and the other the wrong, and thus cultivates only one or the other, distortions and imbalances are inevitable. And when they are not balanced, each way produces inappropriate, ineffective, and even destructive results. It is important for every growing individual to discover the finely balanced interplay of these two universal forces. And since there exists no rule for exactly when and how to switch from one to the other, the way to do so must be found within each person's own rhythm and inner reality. So th does that feel, do, can you recognize that at least intuitively inside of yourself, what he's speaking there? Yeah, okay, good. And, and one must become attuned to one's inner life and soul movements so as to recognize when and how each attitude is expressed, when one or the other is predominant and which is required at any given moment. So, I mean, I don't know if, if uh, I know for myself, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm usually airy on the side of, you know, too much activity and forcing current and usually, right, you know, I, I realize that, you know, because <laughs> I, I get sort of you know, resistance from the rest of the world, right, you know, in some way, right, so, so sometimes we get the feedback through the, you know, the, the trial and error process, right, you know, and other times we're, we're just trying to tune into the moment and the atmosphere, you know, like what, what's here now, what's required, you know, and if we can be a space of being first, I think that's always a really great uh, capacity to develop, because, in the being we're like right there present in that now right and and in that is everything we need to kind of inform our deeper being like like what might need to come forth from us right you know so 
So what needs to be evoked out of us comes from the, that moment, right? That we step into in, in our beingness and then allow the doing to unfold from there. So does that make sense? Have, have you experienced some, sometimes that thing happening, right? You know, where you don't even, you haven't planned it and something is just unfolding out of you that, you know, seems to be perfect in the moment or related to the, overall flow of things somehow. So, you know, the recognition becomes more and more spontaneous and automatic as the self unfolds and integrates with the ego. So this real self that we are, as it integrates again, we're not trying to get rid of the ego, you know, but there's sort of a larger capacity of, of inner authority and, and wisdom um, and and fullness of this of the real self the guy talks about you know and and so as we allow that self you know to come out of the you know prison that we're you know maybe locking it in because we feel like we have to be a certain way you know or we have to be a planner or anything like that you know then like there's there's a, a another capacity within us that comes and then it's 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 going to integrate. There's a dance with the ego and with all of the um, parts of ourselves. And he says these two universal attitudes might also be called the active and passive forces, or still another way of putting it would be to talk about the creative masculine and feminine principles. The masculine and feminine principles exist in the psychic life of all manifestation. They are at work wherever life exists. The power of their harmonious interplay creates forever new manifestations and individualizations of the divine being. I do not refer solely to the fleshly creations. The principle applies to everything. Growth within the personality is also a creation determined by the same harmonious interaction of the male and female principles. Growth cannot come unless the right interaction takes place between initiative and will on the, un, on the one hand and receptivity, surrender, waiting and unfolding on the other. The joining of these two forces creates renewal, new forms, expansion. It bubbles forth more and greater life. So let me pause here for a minute, right? You know, because I, I just, you know, as I'm reading this, remembering, right, and, and some experience, like in the beginning, I mean, even with the path work, you know, it was kind of a long, laborious process that one, you know, did all of this work and one never really, you know, you had new realizations, new understandings, but it wasn't like somehow poof, magically out of that, you know, you were a transformed human being. And, and you know, like, I think also, you know, when I began with the Dharmi, there was this kind of expectation of the, you know, this thing happening in a way that would be, you know, complete and dramatic and sort of all of a sudden, but one of the, even one of the hymns, you know, says, is the power fully descended on us now, we could not bear the intensity of light, right? You know, there's a whole process of, of undergoing and clearing and cleansing. And, and there's a way in which it was through the, that work with that, you know, that I really began to, you know, realize that in spite of, of myself, you know, and my fears, like, you know, my active didn't seem to be effective, right? I wasn't getting anywhere somehow. And then, you know, many years later, I look back and I realized, oh my goodness, you know, all of this was going on and integrating and and I couldn't articulate it at the time and I didn't understand it. And, and it was over this long process, right? That it, the creation emerged out of me. And so there, there was a, a clearer understanding of, you know, this real deep process, like the guide in one lecture talks about how, so we plant, the, you know, we had till the soil, we prepare the soil, we plant the seed, but then it's up to God for that seed to grow, you know, we water the garden, whatever, but, you know, we have to wait on these mysterious forces that are way beyond our own individual self. But if we do our part, right, you know, then we will be amazed at the, you know, the blossoming that takes place, that what comes, 
you know, from that. And it's not, you know, it's, it's a good thing because then our ego can't claim it, right? Like it comes out of this utter mystery that we didn't even know was inside it. And, and it wasn't because we did this thing and did this thing. And so we can say, oh, I'm wonderful. I'm not great. I did it. You know, it's like we did our part. So we have, you know, we can, you know, we can take some credit. We can claim, you know, you know, like the work that we've done, but there's some way in which the the grace and the mystery unfolds within us in a much deeper way than our small self can understand and then claim, right? So this is another way then that we get a sense that we're much bigger than, you know, our identifying with our little personal histories in this lifetime. So um, he says, disharmonious interaction with over or under emphasis on one force thwarts life and produces displeasure, frustration, and restriction. When men and women have not established both masculine and feminine principles within their own soul, the mind, they cannot fully be men or women. So the two principles or forces have certain common denominators. One of them is the alternation of tension and relaxation of firmness and softness. The fertile soil of life, growth, peace, pleasure is the resilience that springs from the pulsation and rhythmic movement of tension and relaxation. This kind of tension is not the painful tension a person feels when the two forces are in disharmony. This pleasant tension is a springboard from which action flows forth naturally and organically. The same applies to relaxation. It must not be confused with the inertia of lifelessness and with lack of energy. Its healthy version is full of life and inner movement, poised in the confidence that the natural action comes in its own time. You don't know, for some reason, as I'm reading this right now, you know, and he, he does go into this and in some other lectures too, I think, you know, like it, it brings to mind, right, the, the, you know, action of sexuality, right, you know, the actual, you know, pulsating rhythm of the tension, you know, that happens when we pull back, right, you know, and the discharge that happens when we push forward in that, you know, pelvic reflex action in sexuality, right, and the pleasure is in both, right, and this is something that he's trying to help us see, you know, in some ways, because a lot of times we we don't like the tension of of the the pulsation, you know that that is in the active or in the pulling back place, you know, in the chart, you know, charging place, um, because it it's it has a little bit of tension, and if we're just always wanting, you know, like absolute, you know, inner peace, you know, then then we might resist that, but but there is a way that that tension can be, you know, like, like experienced in a different way. And so this is part of what he's pointing here too. And I think the most dramatic place you can imagine is in the sexual act, right? <clears throat> so the proper interaction of tension and relaxation is the pulsation, the breathing of the universe and of every aspect or particle thereof. For everything alive in the universe is an aspect of it and must therefore be subject to the same principles and laws. The pulsation of tension and relaxation expresses the integration of these two forces, the male and the female, the initiating and the receptive forces. Every life manifestation is an expression of this beat. The more harmonious the life manifestation, the more integrated are the constantly fluctuating, initiating and receptive forces opening and closing, opening and closing. At a certain stage between these two extreme poles is the phase in which the opening relaxed state is felt as desirable and pleasurable, whereas the closing tense state is felt as painful and undesirable. The dichotomy causes the entity to strive away from one and toward the other state. And yet the more one strives, the more one hinders the natural rhythm for striving creates more tension, even when one strives for the open relaxed state. 
So hence, there is really no other way but to endure the momentary painful state so as to allow the natural rhythm to prevail until the entire personality is free from the painful cramped state. So this is so important here. And, and oftentimes, you know, when we're, we're you know, seeking calm, like, because, you know, like we want to meditate because we're, we're tense and anxious or whatever, you know, and, and we can't get there because we're trying to find the calm and where we are is tense and anxious. You know, this is saying, no, just go be with the tense and anxious, you know, like that's where you are. Right. And so we just be with what is and, and in making that gesture and allowing that, then it opens to this, you know, next relaxation, pulsation movement. Right. But we can't force that because that will just create more tension. So freedom does not mean the cessation of tense closing movement, for that would mean the cessation of life. It merely means that gradually as the pain is transcended, it ceases to be pain. And I don't know if you've experienced that, but you know, like, like if you can relax into the tension, oftentimes there is a different experience of it. And when you're tensing around something that's even a physical wound or a physical pain, or like a headache or something like that, you know, it's like, you know, we, we tend to try to push it away or tense around it, you know, you might try the opposite sometime and just be with it, be with the pain as it is and relax into it. And we do this in yoga as well, like where we're, you know, leaning into a, a pose that has some difficulty or tension in it, right? And if we can just breathe and, and be with the pain, the tension in the muscle, and hold it and, and, you know, help it relax, you know, signal that it, it, you know, can relax as much as possible around the tension. And then that allows a little deeper stretch. So the right interaction of the two principles or universal forces from the point of view of your mind activity and specifically your path work may best be described as follows. The outer deliberate conscious ego and its willpower must be poised in a firm but relaxed way. The resistant and destructive unconscious must be neither yielded to nor anxiously pressured or impatiently coerced. The ego must be alert to recognize what the unconscious expresses indirectly and why it holds back to prevent happiness and unfoldment. To recognize the true unconscious state, the mind has to be calm, observant, and accepting of what happens in the now, thus encouraging the unconscious to express itself. Once the unconscious surfaces with all its unreasonableness, it can quite nat be quite naturally given a new direction and the obstruction will vanish. The process requires a fine balance between the masculine and feminine principles. The firmness of purpose, not to allow the line of least resistance when confronted with the unconscious obstructions, has to be balanced with the waiting receiving spirit in which the expressions of the destructive unconsciousness are accepted. The ideal approach is to use both alternately Instruct firmly and calmly and determinedly the destructive part of the hidden self to express itself. Observe what comes forth with interest, attention, and non-interference. To make this possible, request the divine being that you are deep inside to guide and help you in this process. Again, the determination and instruction is the work of the active mind while the waiting for the manifestation belongs to the passive receiving function. So, you know, this brings to mind a little bit this kind of um, form of meditation that I like that is connected with, um, what do they call? I can't think of the name of it right now, but it's a contemplative form from the Christian church that allows yourself to like you use a, a word that represents this active intention 
you know, to be open and uh, welcoming to the forces of divine spirit, of Holy Spirit within us. So like the mantra, and it's not repeated all the time, but you, the instructions are to, to use this word that signifies this intention and drop the word in so gently that it's like a feather dropping onto a very, very soft pillow. And in that very receptive and still image, like you open in that internal space of receptivity inside and just rest there and wait there and notice. And if you find you get distracted or wander off, you're no longer present, right? Then you can use the word again to bring you back. But otherwise you just stay in the emptiness there, stay in the, the observ observation of the inner space and notice in whatever way the presence and action of Holy Spirit comes. Uh, it's called centering prayer, just remembered. So the human mind is constantly groping to find the right balance of these all important attitudes. Finding this balance is one of the great difficulties each person encounters on the path to harmonious interaction. The way cannot be learned by rules. Only finely attuned listening to your own soul movements will enable you to discover when to use one and when to stop and use the other of these two complementing forces. You must see yourself using the wrong way before you can gradually adopt the right one. How, how often are humans lazy and inattentive to their innermost expressions when governed by a misconception of the passive principle? There they claim rightly that things must ripen by themselves and that healthy growth is a spontaneous process that cannot be forced. But they use the principle wrongly and neglect to go into themselves to face what needs to be faced and change what needs to be changed. At the same time, how often are humans overactive, coercive, and tense towards themselves, as well as others, misunderstanding and mis misusing the active principle? Whenever one principle is given such distorted predominance, it is precisely because the other also exists, perhaps less noticeably. The outer impatience with oneself connotes an inner resistance. Right? You get the, the outer laziness and distorted acceptance of things connotes a fierce inner struggle against the self and its efforts. That's very important to see. <clears throat> so like, you know, oftentimes we have our forcing current with our, one, with our own self, right? You know, and so if we, if we just keep trying to force and don't pay attention to what the inner resistance is speaking and where that inner resistance is coming from, largely just in reaction to the forcing current, right? You know? Like, like usually we want to cooperate with ourselves, but when we come at ourselves with a forcing current, you know, with an inner parental, you know, we're going to trigger the rebellious child, right? It's just a natural law. So, right, the, and then, you know, when we have sort of an outer chill, you know, like who gives a damn or whatever, you know, like it's a distorted acceptance and it, and it usually is hiding, you know, some inner you know, struggle that we have felt helpless against in some way or, or is so painful we can't face, so we just try to ignore. So this fierce struggle must be brought out for it is always present where there are unresolved problems, imbalance, distortion, unfulfillment. The struggle between the self and the self and the self is <coughs> for the longest time projected outwardly so that the struggle seems to be between the self and life or between the self and others. But since there is no difference between you and life or others, <coughs> the struggle is basically between you and yourself. Once you are quite conscious of your true struggle, the imbalance will become comprehensible and a reorientation can begin. <coughs> I don't know what's in my throat. Anyway, so this is so important here. 
and you guys know I've spoken this a lot, right? You know, but the, the key really is this relationship with ourselves, right? And then we're projecting it out. And so to begin to realize and recognize, you know, what our inner dance is and our inner attitude or inner approach with our own self is, you know, so life-changing. So true change is a spontaneous process that happens quite by itself or so it seems. And, you know, this is what we were speaking of before, you know, it's like you really, you can't, you can't attribute it in some way, but it is the result of our unstrained, natural poised outer efforts, not our forcing currents, not our struggles. Although sometimes that's what is necessary to wake up to, you know, what's in our way, what's blocking us, right? So, but, but once we do, you know, like then the actual results come from a very beautiful, enjoyable, you know, process of just being with life, you know, and unrestrained, natural, poised, outer efforts. When people expect direct and visible manifestations of their efforts to come immediately, they become disappointed and discouraged and they start to use less effort and thus fall back into destructive pattern of mind, emotion, and action. And at the same time, they become more and more tense and pushy toward their own processes. So I think we can all see this inside of ourselves and it's part of what we're kind of unraveling and undoing. If people wait for results without going to the trouble of investing their very best into life and the growth process, in the misapplied knowledge that growth manifests effortlessly as if by itself, they too are disappointed and the inner struggle against themselves and life becomes more arduous. So again, he's talking about, you know, like how there's this fine duality and everything. And it's like always a balance of, of divinity and distortion on both sides and, and to find like this kind of, you know, perfect balance that he's referring to is to, you know, recognize that, you know, either side we can, you know, miss misunderstand in some way and have a tendency to do that our lower self kind of wants to tempt us into those misunderstandings hey darlene uh-huh um i have a question that maybe you're about a page ago okay um, but my Let me stay here. my thought my question is uh, it was talking about um how the struggle is really inside not from you know whatever is going on outside and um, I know often the guy talks about very specific and precise experiences and 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 um, perspectives, even though sometimes it sounds like it's generalized. So what I was picturing is, uh, you know, this the struggle between humans. So like, um, you know, Gandhi standing up to you know the empire and. Um, or, you know, somebody saying no to, you know, somebody who's trying to rob them or run over them in a business transaction or something like that, <clears throat> um, that there is a reflection of the external struggle. Does that always mean that if I'm having an external struggle, uh, that I have to have an unfinished business internally around that same struggle like if i was to take care of if gandhi was to take care of whatever his internal struggle was within himself whatever violence was in there then he wouldn't have stood up to the british empire or he would have but it would have been felt different like what what's the what's the subtlety here that i'm not picking up yeah 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 i mean i think gandhi did you know manifest that subtlety you know but but most of us I mean, it's kind of like, you know, we have to let go of control, you know, but we have to speak truth with love, right? And, and there always is, you know, within us, you know, like if, if we are, you know, experiencing something, going through something, right? It's there because our soul has chosen to experience that for some reason, right? And so, you know, there's a, a certain kind of, why is this happening to me? Well, because, you know, I need to feel something here. And usually there is some deep, you know, like interpersonal reference, right? 
you know, that, that, you know, even though it might be a, a universal application or a larger generalized thing, or like a, you know, an outer event where you're getting robbed, you know, there's, there really is like, you know, something healing in that experience, you know, something that you chose, you know, it just didn't happen to you. Some part of your higher self agreed for that to happen. Right. So in the distinction I want to make <clears throat> is that it's not that if I uh, didn't have some kind of internal struggle on a personal level, some kind of unconscious uh, internal struggle, um, that that situation wouldn't have happened. Like it, it basically needed to happen because that's our purpose here. And we are trying to work through these dramas that are actually a reflection of you know, higher energies, right? And that it, it's not that, basically, I, it, there would be no reason for me to be here unless I was working through some kind of um, turmoil with other humans or myself or life, et cetera. Right, it's part of, I think it is part of our, you know, purpose, like that we brought in these places that you know, are not, are in defense some way or are not clear about, you know, like how to meet them, right? You know, so, so we have all of these life experiences and, and when we are traumatized with them also, you know, there's a, a wounding that happens and, and so like, a, we're, we're sort of working to take that sacred wound and transform it because, you know, in that kind of wounding, you know, is, is usually we're, we're manifesting that, you know, because we carry that in some way. And, and then in, in experiencing through it, we have this possibility of, you know, rewriting the script, so to speak, right? And understanding it on a deeper level or resolving it in a different way than we did the last time or whatever. Am I still, am I on, yeah. I'm not sure I'm quite on the same target with you, but, but I think that it's, it's generally what you're saying is, is true. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's making more sense. Yeah. I mean, I think in so, so many ways, like it, it is a little baffling, you know, but, but it's a good key, you know, like if you can just like, even though I can understand it or I don't quite see it, you know, like it, there's some reason why I'm experiencing this apparent event that is, you know, coming to me from life or some other person. And the first thing to do is look at the theme, look at the feeling it brings up and see, well, you know, is that, <laughs> is that a pattern within you? Because that's where you can find, oh, this must be something I'm carrying because, you know, here it is in all of these different ways. Um, but, but sometimes I think they are like, you know, like a soul has already worked with that, you know, and so then, you know, is experiencing a mass event, like the guide says, you know, we all go through these mass events, but he says, even then, if the soul has worked with the process, they're going to have a different experience of that mass event and go through it in a, you know, with less suffering than a soul that, you know, is, is still working through, you know, the, the, the defense and the image and the, you know, kind of being lost in the pain state with it. Great, thank you. So, um, when we can, you know, really invest the best into life, you know, like with our willingness, Right. That's really all that we're ever asked for. And then, you know, sometimes, um, you know, we may not get exactly what we thought we wanted or how it was supposed to be and all of that, you know. So, you know, in, in those cases, like, it's good just again to feel through, like, you know, what is what does disappointment feel like? What does betrayal feel like? You know, it, it's, it's, all of these things are you know, life experiences that we can, you know, as consciousness meet and, and, and in some way, you know, embrace and ride. And like the guide is saying, right, when you can be with it, it transforms, right? Nothing, nothing stays the same except that, that when we 
contract or tense against it. And then that blocks the movement. So the unconscious, uh, the more unconscious your pains and frustrations are, the more you will strain and grasp for a solution. And then that's kind of a misapplied will and action, right? That uh, produces more tension where the mind should be receptive, <clears throat> not only to what comes in from outside, but even more to what comes from out from inside. It often closes into a tight knot formed of pressure against the self. Deliberate receptivity toward the inner processes receiving into consciousness want, wants to work its way out is an essential part of the path. So when I sit in that sort of centering prayer and invite Holy Spirit, oftentimes that's exactly what happens is, you know, it goes in and seems to, you know, connect with some, you know, unconscious material that needs to work its way out that I wasn't even aware, you know, but then I start feeling it sort of bubbling up and sort of become present to it and allowing. So he says, you cannot ever get to know what is within you unless you cultivate this inner attitude. And when people are too impatient, their pathwork is stopped. Excessive tension is always an expression of misunderstanding the process caused by the thoughts idea that inner blocks can be removed by the direct application of the ego will. The ego will has its necessary function, but it is only indirectly responsible for the undercurrents and the will of the unconscious. Therefore, the outer or ego consciousness must treat the unconscious, even the destructive, childish, distorted part of it with respect. I like this part here. You know, I often talk about compassion, but this is something else, you know, like in this relationship that we have with these inner parts of us. And, and respect, I think, is a, is a beautiful way to hold it. It is the respect you grant a being who must not be coerced, but must find its own way. Your own unconscious too must find its own way. If it is coerced, it cannot unfold itself. It cannot respond. It cannot reveal itself. If the outer mind is tense and anxious and forces the unconscious, it is impossible to establish the kind of relationship between the conscious and the unconscious that is necessary to first reveal the latter and then to unify the two. <clears throat> the relationship between the conscious mind and the destructive part of the unconscious can be established by expect, accepting for the time being that perceptions, attitudes, and feelings exist that are often diametrically opposed to each other. Once the destructive and obstructive unconscious aspects are allowed to reveal themselves, the more truthful and constructive convictions of the conscious mind can influence and gradually eliminate the unconscious stumbling blocks. So I don't know if people have ever had that experience, um, you know, but, but it's, it's like there is, a, again, this sort of process that is just, you know, we can trust in and we, you know, it will happen naturally as part of the, you know, way the system works when we're not trying to tense and produce it. And by the way, go ahead. Uh -huh. um, I give you my personal experience around these couple of chapters. Um, I do some home repair work, little little jobs, and yesterday or the day before, anyway, I was putting out a garbage disposal. And I know how it goes in. I got the whole thing down on the plan. They're tricky to get in to begin with. And it, I could not slide the ring around to catch the support mechanism above. And I tried it, moved it every which way, and it would not go in. And I start cussing at that thing. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the front, I was aware, but it's like, it, and it finally, it just, you know, jerked it around and forced it and it worked and got in. But I, it seemed like I had to really get mad at it, of course, it's me, um, for it to work. And um, it's a, it's, and that's, that's just one example of many times I've done that in my life. And of course, my dad used to do the same thing, but um, it's, it's really tricky to try to hold that and to bring in 
a more constructive, conscious uh, energy around it, even though I am able to observe it. But what I usually do is, yeah. is beat myself up for beating myself up. You know? uh -huh, yeah, good. So, so, yeah, I mean, I think it is. It's like, you know, it is how we, we, we naturally respond to these things in a way. So, so judging it or beating ourselves up for doing that, I don't think is particularly useful. But, but yeah, to, to be curious, like, and to feel like, you know, like the energy that's moving through us and what's trying to move and what, you know, what it, I mean, you know, maybe there is something, in, you know, I mean, it worked, right? You know, for me, if usually what happens if I get into my forcing curve, you know, like, like the universe will not, I, you know, like I have to surrender it before the universe will finally cooperate and let me do what I'm trying to do, right? You know, because the more I'm frustrated with it or forcing it, the more resistance I get back, it's almost an equal opposite measure, right? So maybe because you have a belief from your, you know, construction experience that sometimes a little force does work, right? You know, then it, it kind of, you know, goes in and, and, you know, so there's some satisfaction, but, you know, to, to be curious, like, okay, so, you know, what was, was there negative pleasure there? You know, what, you know, was it really, was there, can I imagine some way of getting the same result without going to that place of, you know, being angry and just play with it, right? Yeah, well, part of it's just admitting it kind of to you and everybody here. <laughs> Good for you. There's a lot of yeah. shame attached to it. Uh-huh, um, okay. Well, so and, then, and underneath it is, is uh, there's a core that I'm getting in touch with and working with Keith is uh, the depth of, of, I've already known this for a long time, but the, the depth of my feeling of really gross inadequacy uh, uh, as who I am less than others, should be better, yada, yada, yada. It's, it's still surprisingly deep, even though I've been working with it for years. And, um, so that's, that's what also comes up is like, I should be able to do this. If a smart person was here, he would know how to figure this out. Yeah. Okay, so beautiful. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so yeah, but let go of the yada yada because it's like what's showing up is very important, right? Don't dismiss it, right? So, so feel what that voice brings, what its its energy and its truth is, what it you know, like why it's there, what it feels. It's, it's uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to look at it, but yeah. So, so maybe, so, so here's where like, you know, the observer is not in compassion yet. Right. You know, somehow. I mean, you mentioned the shame, right. You know, and I was, you know, when I was sharing, you know, I was saying, well, that's pretty normal, you know, human behavior, right. I do it all the time myself. Right. You know, so, so, so who's shaming you? Is it you? Well, it's the programming that's shaming me for sure. Okay, so there's a program that shames you. And right. so so look at that program. Maybe it's more than a program, or maybe there's something within the program that could help you free your, free it as well as you, because I'm sure that that program is not all that happy either. Uh, I went blank on that. So, so feel into... Like you're calling it a program, right? But like this is an energy consciousness that has some purpose in berating you. What does it believe it's accomplishing? Well, it's 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 supposed to bring up my self worth, so I'm adequate, so I don't look bad to this customer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, that's the purpose of it, but. I know, you know, I'm, I know it's past backward, but it's difficult to. Yeah. So, so yeah. And it's not about, it's, it's like, so seeing that it's there trying to help you. Right. It's not your enemy. It's lost and confused. So it needs some guidance, but it's kind of embarrassed and it's a little frantic or it's a little you know awkward or feeling or whatever and so go be with it and see if you can just comment and say it's okay well what i caught in what you just said at the beginning was like that i've heard it from other people and i tend to forget this that 
ultimately with all the destructive behavior, the intention, if I go deep enough, is for my well-being. It's yeah. a good intention. So that I yeah. need to sit with that when I get in there and, and be with it as opposed to admonish it and yeah. the Catholic guilt on it. Right, stuff. right. It it doesn't it doesn't need punishment, it needs understanding and then guidance. Because it's it's confused and lost a little. So yeah, you know, but but it it is, it's just trying to protect you or trying to help you or trying to, you know, serve you, you know. And so what we have to do is kind of like, you know, who 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 needs to show up to do its job is our higher self, right? You know, so there's the defense and it's kind of like next to our own higher self for us to defend ourselves, right? We don't need the, the defense. And so if the higher self shows up, you know, we can begin saying, it's okay, I've got this, you know, you, you thought you had this, or you were supposed to do this and it's, it's been, you know, past your capacity in some way, you know, so it's been scary and it's been hard you know, and, and, and it's okay, you know, and, and we can have compassion for those parts of us that are, yeah, acting out sometimes negative or, or even worse, right, you know, but if we don't understand them, if we try to reject them and cut them out of us, then we can never heal because the whole healing process is one of re-embracing and reintegrating and holding everything. You know, I think I, I mentioned this before, but it, you know, it, it's like just such a good example, right? You know, like in that Catholic stuff, you know, we were we were raised, you know, under this quote that says, you know, in the Bible, be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. But you know, I read that that was a mistranslation and the, the actual word that is translated as perfect in the King James Bible is actually whole, be whole as your father in heaven is whole. So that's an embracing of all of the parts of us, right? As our father embraces all of the many parts of creation of him, of that oneness. Yeah, it just occurred to me that I, I often, I've been in this little home repair business for years and. I enjoy it, and then I get triggered immensely by it. So uh, I think somewhat of what Jacob was bringing up and you responding is that uh, no accident. I'm in this. I mean, <laughs> exactly. You want to you want to relish that, you know, and and dive into it. The, the the lecture we'll do next time is kind of related to that too. So I'll, I'll say that it's, it's it's this difficulty that we have with duality again at some level. So. So let's see, where are we? We're on page seven. So I think we can get a little time yet. Let's go ahead and continue. Um, so again, you know, this is key, you know, like we're trying to change the relationship between the conscious mind and the destructive part of the unconscious. And we can do that by accepting for the time being the perceptions and attitudes and feelings that exist, you know, that are sort of opposed to each other or not so, you know, like loving or ideal or whatever, you know, or powerful or, you know, but once the destructive and obstructive unconscious aspects are allowed to reveal themselves without being shamed, without being judged, without being pushed away or denied, right? The more truthful and constructive convictions of the conscious mind can influence and gradually eliminate the unconscious stumbling blocks. So we have to, like, you know, like let them be within us. And by the same token, a relationship between the ego faculties and the wisdom, truth, and love of the divine self can be established when the ego is prepared to receive the latter. So this means awaiting in a receptive, quiet attitude. And once the divine self unfolds through new ideas, feelings, and depths of experience, the ego will be instructed and suffused by the manifestation of the divine. Thus, the two aspects of growth and integration, transforming destructive elements and manifesting the divine self, presuppose the identical dynamics of doing and waiting, initiating and receiving. In one instance, the conscious ego is wiser and more constructive than the buried unconscious. And in the other instance, the buried unconscious is by far wiser and more constructive than the conscious mind. 
So our very, you know, our unconscious is both, you know, the negative unconscious and the higher self, right? Treating both aspects of the unconscious with respect is crucial. Respect is given not to the destructiveness itself, but rather to the processes of growth and unfoldment, to the wondrous laws of the inner reality. The laws of inner reality will eventually become accessible to the respectful mind. And the identical universal laws of creation will also be understood. This is what I mean when I say that you can understand life, creation, and the universe only to the degree that you understand the lawfulness and dynamics of your own unconscious processes. Even the most destructive attitudes result not from evil, but from sheer misunderstanding. When one fully understands this fact, even the most destructive processes are awesomely impressive for their principle and mechanics are based on a lawfulness that is identical to the working of creation at its best. Since evil results from misunderstanding and since the processes are equally wonderful in and by themselves, evil can truly be eliminated only when you learn to be respectful of your own unconscious. Let it unfold in its own way, in its own rhythm. Be receptive and open to what it reveals to you. The receptive attitude is violated by a punitive, anxious, and pressing mind force, a forcing current directed to your own unconscious. The forcing results sometimes alternately, but often simultaneously in excessive tension and anxiety on the one hand and in inertia, laziness, and neglect of active growth on the other. So I think this is really a beautiful thing, right? You know, again, you know, this invitation, right? Like, like to not shame ourselves, to not judge what comes up within us, right? To just respect what's unfolding with, and, and meet it with curiosity and attention and, you know, respect and love. So, you know, maybe, you know, with that, Dick, you know, you can just imagine sort of, you know, visual, you know, like the next time you're trying to put on one of those rings and are, you know, having your reaction, just, you know, like, okay, so there it is laugh at yourself, take yourself lightly, you know, like, or just be curious and watch it unfold. Wow, why is this, you know, so intense for this part of me, right? You know, seek to understand it. Seek to have that deeper awareness of, you know, where it's coming from. I think it's really interesting too, Dick, that you say your father had this same kind of um, self-judgment because, you know, they, I hear so much about this, like ancestral, they call it DNA, but, but this, you know, these, these energies we carry from our parents and they carried it from their parents. Um, I just recently realized that the, I had this really ugly um, inner critic that that's always shaking my inner child and telling her to shut up and be quiet and sit down. And I, I, after realizing, you know, calming down and, and allowing it to come out, I realized that this was my father's. This, I, it's not, he left it for me to deal with. And so it's interesting that you say, you know, your father left you yours, his to deal with too. So now that I saw that, I feel like I can be a little bit more compassionate because it really wasn't mine anyway. It was, you know, my, my poor father was living with this his whole life. So seeing it as a, a separate piece of me allows me to have some compassion for it. Beautiful. Great. Can I jump in again? Um, um, yeah, thanks, Judy, because that, that reminded me of a conversation I had last night with a good friend of mine telling him about these same things over dinner. And um, he brought up a point, he's pretty spiritual and 12 steps, etc. that his perception is you're, you're, yes, your father did that, but he said, what you, what's important to remember is kind of what Judy you were referring to is I'm not only healing myself, I am healing generations back. And I never really caught that till last night. And it's like, yeah. wow, that is a, that is really a powerful, uh, well, what is powerful that it's all dumped on me right now, but it's also powerful to know that 
I'm healing my father and my father's father, etc. Right, right. You know, he's a seven generation, but I, I got a new understanding. So that gives you respect, right? It gives you respect for the, the parts of you that you're carrying and for the, you know, the, the parts of you that are not, you know, doing it perfectly yet because it's a, it's a huge thing. And, and it is, it's like, it's all clan pattern, right? You know, it's like, you know, the guide even says, you know, we take one piece from our father and one piece from our mother, <laughs> you know, like in some ways we're trying to integrate those two forces within us. Well, it also gives me a bigger perspective on the, on the whole issue. So yeah, yeah, it's just, I don't have to just blame myself. I can say, well, exactly. this is a generational thing now. Yeah. So yeah. it wasn't your fault. It never was. Right. Yeah. And in fact, what the guy is saying is not only is it not your fault, but you are carrying it in service. Wow, I love that. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I wanted to say, that if we can stop it here, if, if we have the courage and the determination to heal this poor broken part that's been passed around, the next generation won't have to do it. It could stop with us. And they say that as we heal it in our present, it actually goes back in the past. Right. You know, there's a kind of um, so so, you know, each generation comes in and we're carrying this for ourselves and others. You know, we're carrying it for the world. All of these things are universal in many ways. Right. You know, and, and each one, you know, that transforms it within, you know, like is kind of like creating a neural pathway in the cosmic mind. Right. You know, that others can follow as well. So, you know, there's it's a great service that we each do coming in working through and, and being sort of saddled with these problems and these issues and these difficulties but you know that that is part of our mission and part of what we chose to you know do in service for the people that we loved and maybe try not to take it so personally right like i always thought it was you know me and my defense right right something wrong yeah. with me right it's not really me anyway i don't have to you know, blame myself yeah that's nothing yeah that's an interesting but, um interesting when you talk about generational healing the thought that comes to my mind is since there is no no such thing as time and space in the spirit world there's obviously no such thing as time as relation to your spirit. So if you heal a piece of your spirit in the present, you're healing it in the past too, I guess, right? Yeah, something like that. Or yeah, maybe, and, and in the future, <laughs> like Judy says, and in the future. So uh, the, the piece of your spirit itself is not really, it's, 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 Mm, multi-dimensional and as far as time goes and then i think there's a whole other level that says you know and we were never wounded or like there was never a problem and you know like there's this kind of thing where it can all also be you know some some kind of projection or the whole fall you know was a kind that you know like it we've always been one with god we've never been separate like it's always yeah. you know unfolded in a, you know with, with yeah. love and, and being held in the light, but as we I'm, didn't know it. Yeah. As I'm listening to, to you go through this lecture, I, the thought occurs to me is like, wouldn't it be nice if, if we had more moments of awakening in our lives? We don't really have enough true moments of awakening. We have moments of, of intellectual understanding and we have moments of what we might call emotional healing, but we don't have enough moments of real spiritual awakening. And are you talking about like a mystical consciousness, or what do you I'm, mean by I'm that? I'm talking about an awakening that you might have when you like do the dining, or uh, or a tab of LSD, or or have some kind of like out of body experience, that kind of thing, that tells you that actually makes you know on a on a soul level that you know something's going on that's that some work is getting done because like you said before you could go five years in path work and, and step out of path work and it's like you know for all intents and purposes not feel like you really accomplished anything 
And and there's a, there's a uh, I think a thing that you're getting at, Frank. That's really important in a way, right? You know, but it's it's like I. You know, I went to the diamond for years looking for those, you know, experiences and I never got them, I'm, you know, but the the diamond woke me up anyway. It's right here, right now. We don't, you know, like, I guess I, I needed the diamond because I didn't get it directly, you know, from the path work in some way, but it was within, you know, like the same teachings that the path work are saying. And part of it is what is in this lecture, right? You know, we, we are, it, it's not just emotional healing, the the beauty of life, the kingdom of heaven on earth is here now. And when we can, you know, like step out of, you know, our identification with our effort or our problems, you know, come into this receptive, you know, place and come into this place of affirmation and gratitude, right? You know, of, of feeling connected. Like one of the Daimi hymns says, you know, it's the love of God that makes us happy. Like, so we cannot directly experience God's love for us, right? Um, if, if we're not feeling our own love for ourselves, and we're not in the present moment now. But if we are in the present moment now and we are capable of having, you know, love and compassion for ourselves, then we can be, you know, sort of moment to moment in the joy of life and, and it is a living, you know, it's not like a high or an altered state or, you know, but it is a fullness of living and a fullness of pleasure in the moment to moment living. So, you know, he starts out talking about how we, you know, we don't like the moment or we don't stay in it, you know, but, but that's really where, to me, I would rather be in my everyday life, chop wood, carry water, right, in, in, from this other level. And it is, you know, it's just chop wood, carry water again, but it no longer carries the same issues, right? Because, you know, we, we've let go of this fundamental split inside of us. You guys are all very close, right? You know, where, where you're, you know, trying to fix yourself, right? And again, they say in awakening, you know, something shifts. And so, you know, there's nothing to fix anymore, right? Um so, so there's a kind of way that we have to let go of the self-improvement projects that we think are going to get us there and just be here with it. Yeah, uh, I, I would venture to say that a, a moment of awakening would actually be experiencing the present that, moment. Yeah, it would. Fully. fully. You, can, you can have that in, in, in this, you know, in many, many ways, right? You know, so... And, and I don't know, you know, everybody, breakthroughs and help with, you know, with different things are, are good. You know, meditation is, of course, one system that tries to help us. And I was never very good at that. And, and they do say that things like, you know, the dining are for people that are really stubborn and difficult. So, but, you know, even in, even in that, right, I realized, you know, that um, there was something that that came in that's here constantly and it doesn't have anything to do with an altered state right but it was a healing to recognize that this is here all the time and um somehow the daimi did help me recognize and understand that yeah um, and again it was not where i saw the you know like oh i i worked on a problem and result you know like i i worked in the same place of this, you know, what Dick is talking about, you know, the self-frustration, the, you know, self-shaming, the beating, the, you know, frustration with the self, you know, the why can't I get it right, you know, for a long, long time and lots of suffering in that place. And then something slowly, gradually just pulled me up out of it. And I, you know, it became less and less and now it's almost non-existent. But once we can have that, you know, loving relationship with ourself, no matter what we're going through. And we can know that that's also, you know, like God's love for ourselves as well, that we're feeling, then, you know, it, it, it allows us to say yes to all of the ups and downs of life, which are always going to be going through their things. Right. Yeah. You know, if I had to, if I had to, personally make a stand it goes back to like the first paragraph just about you know where do you feel 
the diff the disconnect between your present life and what you propose your life should be, so to speak, all right? I've always felt like my peace of mind, my happiness is somewhere else. That's how it feels inside of me. It's not doesn't feel like my peace of mind and my happiness is here and now. It's somewhere else out there, some other place, some other time, some other group of people, some other whatever, family, something out there <laughs> somewhere else, you know? God made a mistake. In <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't what I ordered, my lot in life, to, you know? Exactly, yeah. I want to turn it in for a better word. Yeah. No, I understand, you know, and it is. It's like, it's it's what the Buddhists call the dukkha, the discontent, right? You know, it's like, an, and the grass is always greener, and, yeah. and, you know, it's like, it's supposed to be what, you know, something else. This is where I kind of like, you know, the understanding of the mythic processes of life, right? Because, you know, there, you know, you you realize like, like it's a journey and, you know, like you have times where, you know, you're, you know, fighting the dragon or you're lost in the wilderness or you're, you know, you're going through these things, but it's like, you know, it's a part of this overall journey. And there are times when you have to sacrifice or, you know, I don't know how it feels like what the mythic way of looking at, you know, your current life situation, but, you know, you, you know, you came in, you know, with this family and now you're here, you know, still tied to your mother, you know, trying to, you know, help her, you know, say goodbye and, and, you know, and yet, you know, the guide is saying that, you know, some part of you wants it exactly that way, even another, even though another part you know, is resisting and feeling somehow that it's not what you want. And if you can sort of in, you know, like explore, like, well, you know, what is that part? And maybe there's a part of it that's, you know, sort of in negative pleasure, but maybe there is a real deeper purpose that I'm choosing this from my soul to do. And if I could, you know, like align and understand that, you know, if I'm going to choose to, you know, if I'm going to do this anyway, you know, I might as well you know, like shoulder it in a different way that, you know, can bring the yes current into it. And I think that that can sometimes help when we're, you know, doing hard things in life. Right? Frank, can I ask you, have you ever had an awakening and what was your last awakening? And yes, I had an awakening uh, when I was doing a piece of process work in my third year. In TP. Was that the last one? That was the year of sexual fantasy and relationships. Is that correct, darling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had to, um, you're going to love this, Judy. <laughs> we, we had to uh, tell the class what our sexual fantasy was. Yeah, really, right? <laughs> um, some people couldn't do it. Some people just, you know, they just procrastinated the whole year and eventually they just didn't do it. But, um, but during my uh, expression of what my sexual fantasy was, I had a bit of a, um, an emotional meltdown, which sort of prevented me like my, my image of myself, my, my uh, false image of, of myself prevented me from enjoying the fantasy. And actually in, a, in an instant, I went from like, wouldn't this be wonderful if this could really be my sexual fantasy, if I could really actually experience this, to realizing that I didn't think I was worthy of it. And then from that moment, uh, it was like down on the mattress and through a bunch of, you know, physical incantations, uh, trying to like do the process. I, I got this like vibration coming through my body. My whole body started vibrating and the veins in my head were like, my forehead were like, 
exaggerated and, and I was going through a physical transformation and I felt like I was in a way levitating a little bit. Everything was just very physically unreal. And I wanted people to touch me and see if they could feel me vibrating. And then, you know, my classmates were touching me. They were putting their hands on me. I was like, you know, and I just felt like in that moment, I thought, well, you know what? Maybe I'm going to die. And if I die, that's perfectly okay. I mean, I actually felt like, yeah, that would be perfectly okay. Because I realized in that moment that there was no such thing as death. I completely understood in a, in, a, in, in a truly real way that, you know, it wasn't just like some intellectual thing that, you know, death, there's no such thing as death. You just keep recycling, blah, blah, blah. I really understood that it was perfectly okay if I died because there's no such thing as death. And that was, the, you know, really in my life, the biggest awakening that I ever had, I would say. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. All that from <laughs> All that came trying to tell people what my ultimate sexual fantasy would be. Yeah, and, and, and to claim the life force, you know, and claim the worthiness for the life force. And then, you know, like the, the power of the real self, you know, opens through us. And, you know, like, like in some way that reality right you may not be able to get to it in its full-blown form now but since you've had that experience there should be a part of you that still always knows it right yeah and, and there is a part I, of me that always knows it yes i'll never forget that now yeah. that's like in my it's in you know and and, you. and and living knowing that is a whole other different experience or could be you know than living not knowing that right yes, and so, yes. It took away the fear of death. Mm -hmm. It lasted for about a half an hour. Um, the, the, the lunch bell rang. Everybody was like, hmm, got to go to lunch. <laughs> and I was like, go on, just leave me here. If, I, if I'm dead when you come back, don't worry about it, you know? And they did. They went, they went to lunch and I stayed in the room and I just stayed there on the mattress and like vibrating. I was... And in about 15 minutes, one of my classmates came in with a bowl of the lentil soup. You know, the famous right, right, right. Uh, lentil soup. And that bowl of lentil soup never tasted so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it just had, it was like, it, like it had magic in it. In that bowl of lentil soup. Yeah. It was amazing. It was an amazing experience. I, I think it was like sort of like tripping. It was like I was hallucinating without drugs, you know? <laughs> yeah, expanded consciousness, right? You know, and, and so, yeah, we're open in a way and available, accessible to higher energies and other experiences. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't know, like, you know, how that, you know, can also maybe, you know, like, uh, I don't know what, you know what, you could need to you know how that could be woven into your current process you know to because you know what, what you are doing you know right now i can understand where it feels you know like confining and limiting reminds me a little bit did i ever share with you guys that um i think some of you i have i don't know if i have with you frank that the uh feminine journey like there's the hero's journey right you know but then there's also this thing called the the feminine journey let me see if I can find I don't think it. I've ever heard you speak about that. Yeah, I shared it with our group. It was great. Yeah. Let's see if I can pull it up here. It's a little long, but it's, it's very good. And, you know, in some ways it's, you know, the other half of the journey, you know, like there's the, the you know, again, we were talking about the masculine and feminine sort of, you know, dynamics and stuff in this lecture. So, um, says the hero's journey can often be described as the masculine path of transformation. It's a call to adventure, a slaying of dragons, a battle between good and evil. It is ultimately a quest to be reunited with the lost feminine within us for men and women alike. The feminine's journey looks quite different. The in aspect of the path is not a call to adventure. 
It is a call to surrender, a call to quiet and stillness, receptivity and patience. While the masculine braves the treacherous world, the feminine weaves herself a cocoon. Where the masculine seeks to achieve a goal, the feminine waits in uncertainty. She waits in darkness, not knowing, not doing, just being and enduring. Enduring suffering that is sometimes so great and never ending, it seems unendurable. But it is here in this cocoon that the feminine will ultimately be reunited with the lost masculine. To be clear, the feminine is not doing nothing in her not doing, nor is she a victim of her suffering. There is much going on, but it is invisible to the eye. She is active in her passivity, strong in her surrender, and she must strike the miraculous balance of being with her suffering without seeking to control the outcome and also without completely giving up. She is pinned to a cross in which there is no solution. Her task is to bear the heavy tension and submit to the eternal injustice that befell her until hopefully, maybe one day, grace comes from deep within and all around and the cross is reconciled. But day after day she waits, often hidden away, usually in solitude. How long can this possibly last? It could be years. There is no end in sight. And the possibility that will never end is part of what brings her to her knees. She realizes finally she is not in charge here. She cannot incubate this egg of potential on her own. She must hand it over to the great mother. It is she who holds our fate in our hands. It is she who we must entrust our lives to. It is she who teaches us just how much control we do not have and how much we truly do. And unlike the epic battles of the hero's journey, the feminine's task in myths and fairy tales are tedious, time-consuming, take commitment, seem trivial, and require the help of animals and magic. There are no dragons to slay, but rather beans to sort, stinging nettle to weave, straw to spin into gold. She is not sure anything will come of all of this, but neither is she sure nothing will. She only knows she doesn't know, and she must do her part. She must keep following the breadcrumbs on the inner path of her psyche. This slow and exciting path goes against almost every aspect of our culture. The hero's journey, while treacherous and not for faint of heart, is worshipped as the myth of our time. This is not the case for the feminine's way. It does not make for million dollar blockbusters and best selling novels. It opposes our busy and fast paced society and to the immature masculine, both in culture and in the person themselves. It can appear as if the one on the feminine journey is doing nothing and wasting her time. These voices will constantly exclaim, you need to do more, you need to solve this now, you must stop feeling that nothing is happening, you're being lazy, hurry up. If, but if we listen to these voices, we will either refuse the call or find ourselves stuck along the way, unable to surrender, unable to move forward. Our suffering then will grow exponentially and our bodies will protest and our lives may become impossible or maybe barren. Or if we have begun the journey already, but wish to rush to the end, we can break the incubating egg and kill the potential. One of the keys on this path to teach the masculine within to be a comforting and illuminating companion in the darkest darkness, rather than an obstacle. When he learns to honor and help the way of the feminine, the resistance melts, the way unfolds, and the union draws near. And then one day, a day we never knew would come, the cocoon begins to hatch just enough to feel a ray of sunlight on our face, just enough to breathe in the fresh air and hear the new life calling. While the hero's journey ends in surrender, like yin springing from yang and finding the passive in the active, the feminine's journey ends in action, yang springs from yin, the active from the passive. And as the cocoon opens, so too does the world, while returning may not be easy and our life still not perfectly sorted, we will make our way with the strength of the matured masculine by our side and the feminine herself transformed. Beautiful. Yeah. And and I hope you can, you know, hear that, you know, in, in the internal masculine and feminine, right? Because we, we have both parts and we have 
both journeys. And I think it is, you know, our our struggle sometimes with that feminine part of it, you know, and, and then we negate it and we reject it and we judge it and we, you know, and it's hard anyway, <laughs> much less with the masculine, you know, like beating on ourselves for it. So, you know, this, uh, you know, I think it, it helps us to, like, again, respect, respect all parts of the journey, all aspects of what's happening. So let's see if we can go back to the lecture a little. He says, um, let's see. Every good, beautiful, and creative experience in which you feel at one with life and with yourself arises from the proper relationship between the active and passive principles. When you think back to those experiences, you will see that there existed a combination of poised alertness, of active involvement and participation, and at the same time of receptive, waiting, relaxed yet pulsating passivity. When you let these forces flow out of you, life can flow into you. Remember that nothing can come to you from life that you have not made possible, even when it appears to come from outside of you. So let me recapitulate briefly the distortion of the twofold principle of the active and the passive. The initiating active masculine principle distorts into the tight tension of impatience, anxiety, ego pride, which thinks it can do it all alone by sheer outer will. This attitude negates not only the universal powers, but also the person's own unconscious powers to grow and function according to higher laws. It implies distrust of all universal and personal movements within as though they had no existence, lawfulness, or rhythm of their own. Consequently, it also mistrusts the reasoning of these inner forces, further strengthening thereby the conviction that there exists nothing but the isolated ego without deeper connection. In this extremely painful illusion, the real connection remains unused. So the ego is truly unable to function according to its best potentiality. The less these inner forces and movements are made available to the ego to participate in the business of living, the less adequately can the ego fend for itself, and therefore the more harassed it becomes. Isolated ego existence arises from ignorance and pride in the ego as the highest, best, and only reality that can affect life, and it leads to more separation, frustration, and unhappiness due to the painful tension produced by trying too hard in an ineffectual way. It is a lonely existence beset by fears. Conversely, those who in distortion of the passive feminine principle trust in God in a way that virtually abandons self-responsibility, who leave everything to God to justify their own inactivity, also fail to fulfill themselves. They seem to humbly and trustingly let God do it forever waiting but their active initiating powers and the spontaneous indirect manifestations of growth are just as disconnected. If and when the later appear, perhaps as a result of some initiative taken in the past, such persons ascribe the manifestations to a power outside of themselves. You can see how the extremes and distortions are quite similar and ultimately bring you to the same impasse. When you are passive and let things go instead of accepting responsibility for finding the way and perhaps doing what is at the moment most painful, you trust in a false God, a God outside of yourself. For you trust, let's see, for you, your, for you, your whole being is God. And only by using your faculties can you realize this transcendental fact. When you are active with a separated ego alone, instead of living the rhythmic interplay of doing and waiting, of active and listening, you believe the separated little self is all there is to you. So again, like going in and listening allows us to realize there's more than just that outer ego. And again, you must be dis disappointed. So command yourself to finding the key to your life to the truth of yourself, no matter how painful or unflattering it may be, and at the same time, respect and honor your inner processes and allow them to take their course. 
find the balance. It is a constantly changing rhythm or cycle on each individual's path. Each step involves both movements or attitudes. Their proper inner action is the creative power that brings something new into life. Both the initiating and the receptive principles require the integrity of selfhood on the one hand and knowing that one is part of a whole on the other. The latter means respect for the movements that cannot always immediately obey the commands of the mind. <clears throat> so when we want something that's not happening, like at some level, you know, we can relax into a trust that it's the, the timing in the universe isn't right yet, you know, and maybe it's within us that something is still maturing, or maybe it's in the collective that has to happen. I know many, many years I, you know, couldn't understand why nobody was coming to the earth walk. And I think there was a maturing and a ripening of my own being, but also a ripening of the times, right? You know, it's like somehow with COVID, you know, everybody wants to be outside again, you know, and then the East Coast, I was used to West, you know, Westerners, you know, and they more like to be outside, but everybody just kind of lived in their McMansions or up and down the roads in their cars, right, into their offices. And, and so, you know, in some ways now I get a lot of calls for, you know, retreats and forest therapy and, you know, time in nature, right? And it's because, you know, maybe I'm ready, but so is the time. So we, we have to trust in something larger unfolding than just our own little personal journeys and dramas. So even a simple act of med meditation must combine both approaches. On the one hand, you actively formulate your attitude, goal, and intents. Your attitude being that you want to invest the best of yourself. Your goal being to remove obstructions and to grow and unfold the best that is in you. Your intent being to face whatever the truth may be. <clears throat> On the other hand, you become still and waiting, calm and receptive. If answers do not come forth at once, you let go and wait until they do come, possibly when you least expect them, for that is when your mind is relaxed and thus able to receive. When you are ready to receive both the best and the worst in you and are relaxed about both, not overeager and not frightened, then manifestations can appear. If you are equally receptive to both the best and the worst in you and are willing to understand both, then the harmonious rhythm organic growth processes will establish themselves more and more. And I would say, Frank, in some ways, you know, that in that moment, maybe, you know, that's what was going on, you know, that, that really you were ready to receive both the best and the worst. And, you know, you were somehow like catapulted into this, you know, place where the manifestation of the higher, you know, dimensions occurred and you, you had that inner knowing. So, as I said before, such understandings bringing into the state in which tension is no longer pain, so that you no longer alternate between pain and pleasure, then these opposites will be reconciled and the pulsating movements of tension and relaxation will be nothing but two different aspects of bliss. Perhaps you can best find your own inner rhythms when you think of the active pulse beat as doing your best to overcome the fear of facing something unpleasant, giving the best in you to find your true identity, contributing to the process of evolution by your serious and total involvement with your growth. The passive phase of the pulsation is following all such interacts with periods of waiting, waiting for the moment when the results are ready to come. The more you find your own balanced rhythm, the more a new vision will grow. This vision or realization will be that you live 95% of your conscious life responding not spontaneously and directly and independently to what is, which is kind of like that, you know, really a high moment space or when they can break through, right? But according to conditioned reflexes, this will be quite shocking at first and it will be liberating at the same time. For in the instance of recognition, life and the world begin to open up. I do not refer merely to opinions and views you unknowingly echo because you are afraid of the responsibility of being true to your own opinions and views, because you believe you need the approval of others more than you believe you need your own approval. 
I now go beyond this rather superficial level, which we have discussed sufficiently in the past, to something deeper and more subtle. What I mean is that you do not approach every life experience freshly. You are conditioned to respond to it in a certain way. You know, we have the story that we're carrying forward from the past. Oh, here I am stuck with my mother, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. So for example, or here I am with my relationship problems, doing the same things over and over again, you know. And so when you see the, the color red, for example, he says, you generally do not even see it according to your own perception and experience. You see it according to your indoctrination about how you should see red. You have a preconceived idea of red. Or when you see a tulip, the word, the concept tulip is already a reflex so that you do not experience the tulip as though you were confronted with it for the first time. So this is beginner's mind, right? You know, that we're talking about here and we can cultivate that a little more in our life by recognizing sort of these, you know, ways that the stories and the, you know, the images kind of are between us and our eyes seeing what's really there. So you can multiply the effective conditioning and compound the multiplication infinitely. Without exaggeration, 95% of your experiences, sensuous as well as conceptual experiences, are not your own true, free and spontaneous reactions, but preconceived reflexes. They result not only from what you picked up in this life, but also from many, many previous existences. Your psyche is filled with a collection of pre-digested experiences. Most significantly of all and relevant to, are relevant to our topic here, is the experience of pain and frustration. You have been indoctrinated for millennia with the conviction that any frustration is pain. And that is why it is so difficult to make the transition. You know, we were talking about, you know, why do we get so frustrated, you know, and, and it, like, you know, fight in that moment. So this is some of this, I think, here. It is why it is so difficult to make the transition from the pleasure pain pulse beat of tension and relaxation to the liberated state in which tension and relaxation are different, different aspects of pleasure. Unless frustration ceases to be a threat so that the personality does not cramp up and shrink into itself, you cannot detect the free flowing beat of the universe behind your current of fear. Your conviction that frustration is pain and perhaps even danger makes you react in a way that actually produces a painful and dangerous state. Ask yourself, now here is pain. I let myself feel this pain. Is it really as painful as I pretend? I mean here, pretend in a deeper sense. As you convince yourself of the pain, you produce waves of pain by your very reaction, as if the situation were truly so painful. The tension becomes more painful than the pain itself. Once you watch your reactions from this point of view, strange experiences will come to you. You will learn to let the pain, the frustration be. And as we do this, and we actually kind of sink into and feel the sensations of that and let the movement of that happen, then there is, you know, like this, this kind of clearing and, and opening to maybe other, you know, also um, spiritual experiences and awakenings. Little by little, you will experience how the pain turns into a pleasurable movement of pulsation. Only when you let yourself be calm and observant and receptive to what is within you and accept it, will you be capable of experiencing this shift in consciousness. Usually the mind makes such frantic struggling movements against the pain and frustration that it is impossible to come to the pleasurable experience of pulsation. You are usually too busy following your habit bound conditioned reflexes in which you respond to what you believe is good in one way and what you believe is bad in another way. Thus you go on never really experiencing life independently, never really experiencing the real you this particular individualization of the divine. You never experience things as they really are without preconception or preconditioned sensory reflexes. 
So I think this, you know, bears repeating if you want to look at it again at some point, you know, it's like very powerful stuff there. And, and you know, there's this way that we have to kind of tolerate and breathe through. I think I've used the term sort of like, like as if you were, you know, giving birth, right? You know, sometimes to, to get to the level of, you know, this pulsation and the pleasure sometimes, or at least the, the less tense, you know, hard pain that we're creating in our resistance and contraction against the contraction. So he says, may this lecture be the next guidepost on your way into your own unconscious and learn to accept it as it manifests so that you establish the proper relationship of tension and relaxation in your approach to yourself. Such balance can change your attitude toward yourself and teach you to accept yourself as you are. And because of this basic acceptance, you will gather momentum and strength for further surging forward. Your inner soul movements must live these principles. It is never sufficient to know them, although knowing them is often necessary and helpful to lead you into the climate in which living them becomes possible. Calmly let yourself be and let yourself unfold. Be blessed, my dear friends, in all your further undertakings for spiritual growth. Each step forward brings you nearer to the realization of who you really are and what life really is, a continuum that need not ever know the fear of death, a continuum of living and rejoicing. Be in peace, be in God. Okay, that beautiful lecture. Any final comments in closing? What do you have there, Dick? It's a book I somebody recommended. Oh, yeah. Untethered Soul. Surrender. You know, I'm familiar with it, the Surrender Experiment. Oh, the Surrender Experiment. Oh, no, I, I knew his Untethered Soul, so I haven't, I haven't seen yeah. that. So it's, a, it's a good one, and it, it fits this, this lecture very well. And it's an easy read, true story, and he comes at it from a Zen Buddhist point of view, but um, I highly recommend it. It's a, it'll pull you in. Oh, well, yeah, we, we need lots of... I mean, reminders and help and support with that surrender stuff. That's kind of like the strongest, you know, the hard, the hardest, most sort of counterintuitive thing <laughs> to do. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Thanks, Darlene. Thanks yeah. everybody for a wonderful Thank you, discussion. Darlene. Yeah. Thank you, Darlene. Yeah, this was wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Good carry all. Okay. Good night. Yeah. Bye. Take care, everybody. Good night.